sorry. <laughs> well, thank you, Mary. Thank you, everyone, for um, sticking around. Actually, it's not sticking around because the presentations today have all been absolutely fabulous. I love the concept of the ghost town, um, which it's not. You know, it's just a. We'll talk about memory landscapes, um, of which I believe Brunswick is one. But this has been a fascinating day, and I'm absolutely delighted uh, to be asked to um, finish it out. And I'm just the mouthpiece for this uh, research project, um, and I'll share with you uh, the team that's working together on this amazing recovering identity project. Um, as Mary said, we're the guinea pigs. We sort of uh, stepped out of the box along with Arch and Livable Frederick Planning and Design Office to begin uh, what we hope will be uh, for Arch and Frederick County, um, a countywide project. Um, Catoctin Furnace um, took the north part, obviously, of the county because that's where we're located. And for those of you who know um, the Catoctin Furnace Historical Society, you know that we are primarily, while we have a museum, the Museum of the Iron Worker, we are primarily a research uh, historical society. Um, we've been involved in a number of research projects um, of which recovering identity um, is one of several that are running uh, simultaneously. So I want to first introduce the project. Um, we're now in the first year of a two-year project, um, and we're in about month seven of the project. Um, it is funded by Maryland Historical Trust non-capital grant funds, as well as certified local government funds that run through Frederick County. And three organizations or three groups are working together on this project, which is a very important uh, point. Um, first of all, the Arch Society of Frederick County, uh, then Livable Frederick's Planning and Design Office, and then finally, um, the Catoctin Furnace Historical Society. So that tells you who we are. And now let's talk about uh, what we've been able uh, to do. Where is our research project? As I explained, we are looking at the North County. We chose five historic election districts. And while election districts change, uh, are, are not you know, stagnant um, or stable in the 19th century, um, we selected five um, that uh, from the 1850s um, and that is our project area. This makes it easier to do some of our primary documentary research because as we look through um, the um, records, we're within a single, or in this case, five um, election districts. So our project area begins at the Pennsylvania line, naturally, although I will uh, explain that uh, one of our project um, uh, study areas is going just a little bit over into Pennsylvania, but don't tell the Maryland Historical Trust or the CLG. Um, to the east, um, we go as far as the Monocacy River, and then a little, um, you know, the election district um, takes us a little, uh, uh, almost to that in the south, southeastern part of our project area near Utica. We are including Utica in this North County survey. To the south, it's basically the Lewistown area, just a little bit south of that, um, but Lewistown is our southern boundary. And then to the west, the Washington County line. So as you can see, it is the northern part of, the, of Frederick County. The two maps that you see on this um, slide are the 1858 Isaac Bond map. And you can see the five election districts that we are working in. And then you can also see our study boundary on a modern street map, because obviously when we're trying to find historic structures, we do have to drive modern roads, look at modern SDAT maps 
and Google Maps and find where we're actually looking. Uh, because um, unfortunately, in northern Frederick County, we're not in an 1858 uh, or 19th century landscape um, anymore. So that is our project area. And the rest of the recovering identity project areas would be similar in size, but they would be the eastern part of the county, the southern part, and then the southwestern part, which would be Brunswick. How do we do what we do? Well, obviously we start with maps. Maps are essential to finding um, the structures that we're looking for in recovering identity. These are some examples of maps that we've, historic maps that we've superimposed over modern uh, topos in order to understand how lot lines have changed and where structures are still extant. This is the Lewistown Powell Road area, which is one of our study um, areas. And you can see that we've outlined in red um, some of the historic um, properties that we have identified as being African-American owned. And then we also have the Emmitsburg uh, map, which shows Lincoln Avenue, which is just one block um, south of Main Street, uh, also known historically as Africa or Little Africa. And again, you can see some of our project um, area, um, uh, focused areas where we have historic buildings. Um, and these talking about Sanborns, uh, 1860 Sanborns, this is the 1890 Sanborn. Of, um, of the Emmitsburg area. And then the other map in Lewistown is the 1873 Atlas of Frederick County. So these are very helpful for us figuring out what buildings we now see on modern maps. As you can see, they're superimposed um, and they're under the historic map so that we can see what is, is still there. So obviously we depend very heavily on the written documentation uh, in census records and land records, as well as probate. Um, any records that we can put our hands on actually um, that identify for us African-American families um, are gold because that helps us realize where people lived so that then we can go out on the ground and see where those structures were and if they're still um, still present, still standing. Um, this uh, on the left of the slide is a uh, land record that shows the purchase of a two acre lot by Charles Lee from Andrew Smith. This is in the Emmitsburg area and the Lee family uh, figures very um, large in our research uh, project uh, in that area along Annandale and Crystal Fountain Roads. And then the other image on this slide is the 1880 census of Lincoln Avenue in Emmitsburg. The census records are essential as well because they tell us the race of the individuals who are living along a street um, and in this case, it's Lincoln Avenue, and the majority of the um, residents of Lincoln were African American. It's also essential because it tells us their age, their families, it helps us trace their um, genealogically, um, who was, you know, which was the next generation, did they stay in the pardon me, did they stay in the house? Did they leave? So these are some of our methods um, that we use for recovering identity. So oral history and local informants are also absolutely essential to what we're doing. It's very, very time consuming, as you can imagine. But really, for me, um, it's hard to choose what's the most fulfilling. But this is probably it. Knocking on doors, going in, being shown historic photographs, speaking with people, learning their family history, transcribing it and then being able to fit it into a larger uh, narrative of this family and their, um, their impact on the community. So there are two, um, if you have a moment to read these, um, these are just two snippets of the myriad of oral histories that we've done. Um, Debbie Richardson um, in 2021 um, talks about the Brown family, um, I'm sorry, that's Debbie Smith, um, a typo in that. That's Debbie Smith, um, an interview that I did um, 
for her um, about the Brown family and the um, Williams family along West Lincoln Avenue. And then the second oral history snippet here is about um, Patricia Snowden uh, and her family and Powell Road um, in Lewistown. And Patricia was talking to us about her um, family and their, um, their role in the goldfish capital of the world, which was um, the Lewistown um, area. We also found out that Patricia's great grandfather, I believe it is, started lily ponds. So they're very, very um, essential um, to the goldfish um, operation of uh, not only Lewistown, but lily ponds as well near, um, near Buckystown. So these oral histories are just amazing in the, what they fill in so much information that the records don't have, um, the houses don't have, but put all together, they allow us to know um, a deeper, richer story of the African-American population in Northern Frederick County. So what is the goal? I mean, what, what are we doing here? Um, recovering identity is specifically geared toward recording the architectural elements that are still extant in Northern Frederick County. So in other words, we're really doing, we're doing historical research, we're doing oral histories, we're looking at census records, um, we're looking at historic maps, but ultimately we are looking for standing structures, structures that still are standing that tell us um, something about the, you know, that, that were, you know, associated with, owned by, lived in by, built by, worked in by the African American population. So that's really what the MHT non capital grant and the CLG grant are funding that just the architectural survey, but all the other research obviously has to come into bear in order for us to get at where are these structures? And part of that is because there has been, frankly, so much change um, in the landscape and in the structures um, in Northern Frederick County as, as everywhere, but particularly we're obviously seeing this in Northern Frederick County. We are looking not only at individual buildings, but we're looking at built at areas that would become extensions of, his, of existing historic districts or would be historic districts in and of themselves. So that is the goal of this project, actually recording structures that are still on the landscape. The product, therefore, are MIHP forms. They are the Maryland Inventory of Historic Properties forms. And this is the gold standard, if you will, for all architectural survey in the state of Maryland and every state in the United States that um, has a similar form. Uh, this is all under the auspices, if you will, of the Historic Preservation Act of 1966 and the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Architectural Survey and Recordation. So again, in Maryland, they're called MIHP forms. And the goal of the Recovering Identity Project is really to complete as many of these MIHP forms as we can. This MIHP form is one that my company did, just to give you an idea, this is the German Orphan House of Washington, DC. You can see it includes historic photos. It of course includes a map that shows exactly where the property boundaries are. Um, and then there's a deep description of the property and not only how it is today, its current state, but also historically what it would have looked like um, and what its integrity is. So this is an essential part of the process, recording what is there now, recording what was once there, and then determining both the integrity and the significance of the standing structure. So from the beginning with recovering identity, we have said that one of our products, in addition to the MIHP forms, will be a protocol that will um, 
inform the um, architectural survey that we hope will come after us um, in the rest of Frederick County. Um, and so we want to identify the best practices, the issues, the methods for identifying and recording historic properties associated with African American history. And this, as I said, protocol is meant to be applied to the remainder of Frederick County and maybe beyond if we're successful. So this, this research project, um, there have been some issues that we've encountered and these are not insurmountable, um, but they're very, um, uh, I wanna share them with you because I think they're, it's very important to explain why what we're doing is not easy. Um, first of all, many buildings associated with African-American history have been demolished. And that shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone. Many of these buildings were smaller vernacular structures. Um, and as the 20, late 20th and early 21st century have uh, unfolded, um, land values in Frederick County have gone up. Land values in Northern Frederick County have did not go up as much um, and therefore you could purchase um, a structure uh, and be, you know, uh, willing, if you will, uh, to tear it down and build a new structure. So this has been a significant impact on the viability um, and the um, existence of a lot of these uh, 19th century vernacular structures. They are small. Um, the lots are sometimes large. And so the zoning um, allows um, a structure to be replaced um, and uh, it's, um, you know, it's an economic decision on the part of many buyers to take down the historic structure and build um, a modern structure that they feel is more um, uh, conducive to a 20th or 21st century way of life. So that's a real issue, needless to say. And buildings associated with African-American history um, that remain have been highly modified. And again, this speaks to um, the uh, size of the structures, the vernacular nature of them, um, people wanting uh, great rooms or garages or they wanna bump out this for a master bedroom or bump up the roof line for a rec room or another bedroom. And of course, these are all changes to a historic structure that, um, that create um, an issue with its architectural integrity. And finally, um, historic buildings associated with African-American history are occasionally owned by whites, rented to African-Americans, and that creates problems in the paper trail of the ownership, which is the most reliable uh, documentation. Census records are useful, but one can never know exactly how the census taker is walking down the street. Did he cross the street? Did he go from house to house? Did he zigzag? Uh, did he get tired and nobody was home and he went to another street uh, or road and then came back to this particular place later? And these are all issues one runs into, into one has to be very careful with census records, which would tell us who was living there, but not necessarily who, was, uh, who owned the structure. So those are some of the issues um, that we have run into. And then I'm gonna go into some details on these issues. So we were very excited. This is Northern Frederick County, right north of Emmitsburg um, in the area just um, below the, the, well, you can see the Pennsylvania line. So there were several houses in this historic black community um, north of Emmits called, Emmitsburg called Poplar Ridge. And in particular, the Butlers um, live there um, and, the, the Coates family, but there are no buildings still standing from this period. And the road um, was that we see now, Irishtown Road, um, is not even on the map. So it was a very confusing um, area, but the memories, however, 
remain. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. So that is an issue, obviously, um, that we run into in this survey, which is we get excited, we find an African-American structure um, and it's gone. Issue number two, the building is greatly modified. This is on Tract Road, again, in the Poplar Ridge area, just north of um, the town center of Emmitsburg. Um, and the current guidance for recording African-American structures for National Register eligibility, which is, of course, what the MIHP form follows, is that if modifications were made by anyone other than the Black descendants of the, the, the builders or the owners of the structure, the building lacks integrity. So again, this is, this is the way, so if a Black family owns a structure and they make the modifications, the modern, you know, the bump out, the this, the that, the building, because it's still black owned at the time the modifications were made, can retain or does retain its architectural integrity. However, if the building has moved from the ownership of the African-American um, family to white ownership or ownership that is not black, then the modifications uh, that are made render its, its uh, integrity um, moot, basically. It takes away its integrity. And I have some things to say about that very narrow um, definition of, our, of integrity, um, but I'll save those for a, a moment. So here's another example of the um, integrity loss, quote unquote. This is 9005 Crystal Fountain Road. This is in um, the Poplar Ridge. Um, I'm sorry, this is in the Pleasant View um, area of um, outside of Emmitsburg. Um, the photograph on the left is um, the structure as it appears now. The photograph on the right is the structure as it appeared when the current owner who is white purchased the property about um, 25 years ago. This is an African-American structure. Um, and when you go into the house, um, and walk through it, the core, that log structure is intact. And I mean, fully intact. It is, it is within that stone um, structure. The stone structure has a roof line change. It has a bump out at the back. Obviously it's been um, facaded with, um, with the stone. Uh, there've been some window changes, but that, when you go in the house, that log structure exists. And so to me as an archeologist, I'm not an architectural historian, but to me as, as an archeologist, we see artifacts that are modified. As a matter of fact, that's one of the things we say that we study cultural objects that are either made or modified by man. And so for me, this modification is not a deal breaker for integrity. Um, and part of that is because of the scarcity, in my opinion, of these African-American structures. Um, but this is a perfect example of what we um, have run into in our recovering identity. And another issue that has come up is ownership. So along Annandale Road, which is just, uh, if you go to Mount St. Mary's and um, go behind um, the, the dorms, turn right and skirt the um, bottom uh, or the, the toe, if you will, of the mountain, that's Annandale Road. It's called the Pleasant View Community. This is very much an African-American, traditional African-American community. Um, and the historically, all of the adjacent property owners to this lovely chestnut log house, which is undergoing restoration, are black. But this house was owned by whites. But we are still pursuing this information because we think it's possible that these were black tenants in this house. Every other building along Pleasant View, along Annandale and Crystal Fountain Road every other person was African-American. So we find it, um, we, we want to see if it's possible that while this property wasn't owned 
by an African-American family. It may have been inhabited by an African-American family. So the historic black communities of Northern Frederick County that we've surveyed so far are of course in the Emmitsburg area, the West End, which is Lincoln Avenue, the Hampton Valley Road area. Um, this is really interesting because Hampton Valley, I mean, Hampton Furnace predates Catoctin Furnace. The enslaved from Hampton Furnace were, um, uh, well, may have been moved to Catoctin. Certainly there was a lot of back and forth between Hampton and Catoctin. Hampton, of course, being 15 years earlier than, um, than Catoctin. Um, and then in this area of Pleasant View and Poplar Ridge, the African-American communities that we've located, um, Pattersonville, which is up um, in the colliering um, and woodcutting area above Catoctin Furnace in the, what we call the Greater Furnace Lands, and then the Powell Road area of Lewistown, very much an African-American enclave, and then the area around Utica. So those are the surveyed areas that we have, um, we're looking at so far in this, um, in this project, but these are not the only areas. This is just what I'm going to talk about today. So I mentioned Irish Town Road um, above Emmitsburg, right on the Pennsylvania line. And interestingly enough, we realized that we had, uh, through oral histories, um, African Americans living on Irish Town Road, but we couldn't even find Irish Town Road on historic maps. And we figured out why that is. It was just, um, it was basically a road trace that was named later. But the oral histories have told us that it's the ancestral home of the Butler family. This is an African-American family of Emmitsburg, including Abe Butler and Tom Butler. And Tom Butler was a gentleman who um, took the trash, um, his job, and he, you know, he, people paid him to do this, obviously, was to collect the trash from Emmitsburg and then take it to his property along Irish Town Road. Interestingly enough, the Butler land was primarily in Pennsylvania um, and such that they were only paying taxes to the Commonwealth, according to oral histories that we've made. Um, and they were not, there was such the small live, sliver of land that was in Maryland um, was so uh, small that they weren't paying taxes to Maryland. What I find interesting is it was really liminal, it was liminal space then between Pennsylvania and Maryland, which could be attractive to a family, a free African American family um, that was making their way pre Civil War um, in what was uh, still uh, a state that allowed um, and, uh, you know, uh, encouraged, if you will, um, slavery. Unfortunately, the Butler family properties that were on this property um, are now demolished. So Pleasant View um, is the area that I spoke of earlier when I showed you the structure that is the lone white owned structure in a very much a, a black um, community. It's a rural black community just west of Emmitsburg along Annandale Road and Crystal Fountain Road. Um, it was developed from land bought by Charles Lee in the 1820s, who's a free African-American, and Stephen Green, another free African-American in the 1830s. And many of the Pleasant View residents were employed by Mount St. Mary's College in the 19th and in the 20th century. Um, so you can see this um, 1873 map, um, and you can see the Lees and the Greens um, these are all African-American families along Pleasant um, View. And I will tell you that Pleasant View is the most beautiful view you are ever going to have of the Valley um, uh, of Emmitsburg and beyond. You can see all the way to Tawny Town. It's an amazing area. Um, this structure at 16732A Annandale Road um, was the property of Charles Lee. He purchased his freedom in 1804 uh, for 100 pounds. He purchased his son Isaac's freedom in 1807, his wife and daughters in 1814. Um, and then he, in 1813, purchased his acres at Pleasant View. Um, and he worked in, he was working in agriculture along with his son. This is a fabulous structure. It is owned now by a European-American family. Their last name is Ott. 
um, and uh, you can see the indenture of um, the of uh, Andrew Smith to uh, Charles Lee, black man, formerly the property of John M. Baynard. This is a double log, double stone house. It has two front doors. Um, unfortunately, right now it's um, vacant. Mrs. Ott, who lived here um, until she went into a nursing home, um, was uh, still was using uh, an outdoor, you know, an outhouse. Um, there is a spring in the back as well, um, and we're hoping that um, the family that owns it will, it does have a good roof on it. It has a standing seam tin roof, so it's not in, um, in any grave danger. Um, you know, a, a structure like this can, can stand, with a good roof, it can stand for years um, because it is a stone structure, but it is just a gem and it is absolutely African, an African-American structure um, in, uh, along Annandale Road. And right across Annandale Road, um, looking again, uh, you can see the view off to the east. Um, is 16731 Annandale Road, another Lee property, but also the Butlers, the son of Henry Butler. The Butlers, the Lees, um, th these families in Emmitsburg um, intermarried naturally. Um, they were, you know, colleagues. They were, um, they became extended families, the Lees, the Butlers, the Richardsons, the Williams, uh, the Coates. Um, and one of the things that we're doing is working through these genealogical, um, uh, you know, family trees, um, and it's just fascinating um, to, to see the families as they evolve um, and are very much, um, uh, a, you, know, um, you know, cohesive and, co you know, in the, in the community. So moving into Emmitsburg, into the West End, also known as Africa Street, and this is a, a May, we, we are not absolutely sure that the phrase Africa was utilized by the residents. However, it does show up um, in the documents. And so we're using that uh, phrase, um, you know, only because it's, it's um, uh, you know, it's something that you know, identifies uh, the area. Uh, Lincoln Avenue is one block off of Main Street. Um, and this is a Sanborn uh, map, as you can see. So what we've been doing here is looking very closely at this string of African-American um, structures that line Lincoln Avenue. This is the property of Peter Brown in 1870. He was a 73-year-old laborer living with his daughter-in-law and four grandchildren. This is a very interesting structure. You can see that the windows have been modified. There is a door here that has been modified. It is gable facing. Um, I mean, street gable facing, which is very unusual, but we also have an oral history now that's telling us that this was not just a dwelling, um, but that it was also a shop. Um, so that's 413 Lincoln Avenue. 415 Lincoln Avenue is the home of Debbie Smith on the west side. Unfortunately, no longer extant was a Lincoln School, an African-American school from 1869 to no later than 1902. Um, and then next is 437 Lincoln Avenue, the property of Marie Williams. She actually lived on Old Frederick Road and moved here when she was 10 years old, still lives there. The Williams family purchased this property from another African-American family, the Brown family. So I'm going to go through, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to go over time here. So I'm going to go through some of these relatively quickly. But um, this is, that's our, some of our Lincoln Avenue research. And I'm going to go back to Lincoln uh, in just a moment. Also in Emmitsburg on West Main Street, we have this very intriguing property that never looked like a dwelling, as you can see. Um, but this morning <laughs> in an oral history, um, I found out that um, the family that owns it now believe was told when they purchased it that it had been an African-American school. We do know whether that's true or not, and we have to get to the bottom of that. It was owned by Hetty Parker and Isaac and Gertrude Downey, uh, all three of whom at different times, first Hetty Parker and then the Downies. All of the, da the Downies and Hetty Parker are African-American. So um, yet another structure that we've been able to find in Emmitsburg. 
So there are other historic black spaces in Emmitsburg that we're researching. Um, obviously the colored school that has apparently has moved or did move uh, because in 1902, we have newspaper articles that tell us that the old school um, had become dilapidated. Um, and was no longer being used. There is a Methodist cemetery. It's now the site of the municipal swimming pool. There are the graves at St. Anthony's Grotto, uh, a deep history of enslavement um, and free African-Americans working at Mount St. Mary's, St. Euphemia's School, uh, which was educating um, African-American children far before Brown versus Board of Education um, and the carriage house or implement barn at St. Joseph's. So the lost buildings on Lincoln Avenue um, are the free colored school that I told you about a moment ago beside um, um, the um, um, Debbie Smith's house. And then the colored ME chapel, um, which may appears to have been a white church, then later possibly a colored church, although um, this map, we haven't been able to corroborate this information. This map says that it was colored, but we're still working on that. But then also look at this, the iron jail cage. Now, given that Lincoln was the African-American um, community of Emmitsburg, it's chilling that um, the town put um, a jail um, adjacent to in plain view in a sort of panoptic control situation, if you will, to the African-American community on Lincoln Avenue. The Lincoln Avenue Cemetery now under either the swimming pool or the park, um, we know from this, um, uh, this clipping that while John Constant was not buried there because his wife changed, his widow changed her mind at the last minute and had him buried at Mount St. Mary's, but his mother was buried there. His aged mother uh, was, when she was called to rest, she was put in the Lincoln Avenue Cemetery. We have been asking everyone we can find and looking everywhere we can find for information about what happened with the movement of these graves when this pool was built in 1973. Um, and thus far, we cannot find anyone who's been able to tell us what happened with these graves. So we want to crowdsource that question and see if anyone has a memory. We tried an ex-mayor of Emmitsburg, but unfortunately found that he was deceased. Uh, we've talked to the current mayor, of course. Um, so this is a mystery. We really want to get um, some more information about that cemetery. Rick Smith did this amazing map of the St. Anthony's Grotto Cemetery. Um, what he found was that when you go into the grotto, as you're driving, uh, you park your car and you walk toward the visitor center, which is at the top right of this photograph, there is a row of African-Americans buried there. They're all grouped together in that row. Um, the cemetery was established in 1806. Um, and then uh, it has many Black families, and of course the Lees who lived on Annandale Road are buried here as well as uh, butlers and other um, African-American families from both Annandale, Crystal Fountain, um, and uh, Irishtown Road, as well as um, Lincoln Avenue. Um, so we've argued that this is in fact part of the architectural, um, you know, or should be, I should say, part of the architectural um, uh, survey. Mount St. Mary's University has a long history of enslavement. Um, they had enslaved people that were conveyed for term service um, as tuition payments. Um, this particular cabin, which is known as the John Hughes cabin, was moved to a location just below uh, the cemetery and the grotto. It's very likely that, very likely, that it was built using labor of enslaved persons. Um, and uh, we um, will be surveying this, this as part of our, um, of our survey. The structure has been moved, but its integrity, um, in our opinion, remains. 
St. Euphemia's School and Sisters House in Emmitsburg. Uh, oral history tells us that the Black children were taught in a room above the kitchen. They also had to enter the school from a separate door. They were not allowed to enter through the front door. Uh, there was a segregated, segregated playground, and one of the um, uh, children was... Um, was interviewed or, or told a story that her father said, yes, you were separated, but at least you, you know, were able, you got an education. Uh, an oral history that I did about a week ago um, said or, or included um, the information that the, the African-American students um, were appalled by the, the condition of their outhouse. Um, and so they whitewashed it, they cleaned it up and they whitewashed it. And it was so clean that the white children wanted to use their outhouse. Um, so the carriage barn or implement barn at St. Joseph's Academy um, is connected to James Augustine Briscoe. He was employed as a teamster um, at St. Anthony's Academy. Um, he died in 1897, and it was through his obituary that we were able to figure out his connection to the structure that is the carriage barn or implement barn. Um, and they stopped his wages when um, in uh, November of 1896, in early January 1897, he died, um, but they, the sisters um, said that he could have a home for life. Well, you know, uh, he um, uh, unfortunately only lived um, three more months after that, but he, um, he was associated with the carriage barn or implement barn as a teamster, as his place of work. So that's very much part of recovering identity. So now we're going to move to Lewistown and Powell Road. Um, this is an African-American enclave um, uh, that is the, on the south side, if you will, of, of uh, Lewistown. Uh, 11031 Powell Road was the Lewistown Colored School in 1870, um, but only for three two months, I believe, um, quote unquote, the trustees have stopped the school not being able to raise the funds to continue longer. So yes, it was January and February of 1870. Um, it may also have been used as a church. We're still working on that. 11029 Powell Road, um, with its outbuildings, African-American owned in the 19th century, 11027 Powell Road, again, African-American owned, Richard Richardson, uh, 11019 Powell Road, again, African-American owned, 11024 Powell Road, the home of Patricia Snowden, the only African-American remaining from this very large enclave. Um, this house was built by her father about 70 years ago. It is... Um, not the first house that the Wolf's, um, Wolf family, of which Patricia is, um, built in uh, Lewistown. They have the historic Wolf house is also going to be surveyed, um, which is uh, very exciting. It still, um, it still stands. Uh, there's also a burial ground along Powell Road. Um, Richard Richardson, uh, who owned the house across the street, um, also um, owned this burial ground in 1861. Unfortunately, um, there does not appear, there, there are no stones extant at this point, but from the deeds, there's no question about the presence of this African-American burial ground. Moving up to Pattersonville, Catoctin Hollow Road, it's part of the greater furnace lands of Catoctin Furnace. It was the area of collaring and later the stave mill. Um, and you can see some of these uh, areas that were African-American owned uh, historic properties on our, um, uh, along Catoctin Hollow Road. This is Bob's Hill. This is a very exciting um, development. Um, Robert Patterson was at the Antietam Iron Works. Um, and since the Pattersons um, moved back and forth as iron workers, it's possible that they were at Catoctin or another iron furnace uh, or uh, possibly in Virginia before they were at Antietam. Um, they come back to the Maryland area. Um, they come to Catoctin Furnace. They are in uh, the records at Catoctin as free workers 
Um, and in 1853, Robert Patterson purchases Bob's Hill, um, what has became known as Bob's Hill, and he um, built this, um, this dwelling on Bob's Hill. Oral history indicates the property was a peach orchard. The Patterson family grew, packed, and sold peaches. Um, and they may have used the first floor of the, what, is, what is the dwelling for that, as well as living on the second floor. There's also a second dwelling foundation, or it's actually, I wouldn't characterize it now as actually a foundation. It is a pile of fieldstone, but oral history is telling us that it was known as the old Patterson place, which indicates that more than one family was living on the property. Not at all surprising. It's a very large tract of land. And uh, the oral history has also corroborated that the structure that we see was extant when the Patterson family owned the property prior to its purchase in 1903 by the Willard family. Um, the Willard family, who is white, lived there. Um, Alice Willard lived there for 97 years, and it's still in the Willard um, family, um, and they are thrilled uh, that we are doing this research about the Pattersons. <clears throat> Uh, going down to the southern part of our project area to Utica, we have two notable properties that have cropped up in our research, one of which had already been looked at by um, Carrie Svedra and by Frederick County, and that's the Snook Farm. It, it had um, enslaved laborers before the Civil War and then employed free African Americans afterwards, including Calvin Wolf who is um, an ancestor of Patricia Snowden. And then secondly, the Sands or Sanders Farm on Lenhart Road, a lovely stone structure. Um, Mr. Sanders, um, John Sanders was black. He assessed at a value of $3,600 in the 1870s, which was a very high value. Um, we don't know, we've lost the Sanders family. We don't know where they went when they left Lenhart Road. So again, crowdsourcing information. If anybody knows where the Black Sanders family went, um, they were obviously very well to do, um, but they left the area uh, as so many did. The Snook Pitzer Farm, Calvin Wolf was a blacksmith and a farrier. And as I said, he's an ancestor of Patricia Snowden, who is uh, still living on Powell Road. Uh, there were enslaved in the census and people um, were working there. Patricia remembers going there as a child with her grandmother. Mrs. Pitzer would call her grandmother and ask her to come and and cook, prepare meals when Mrs. Pitzer was having large family gatherings or parties. And Patricia remembers going there um, as a child many times. And so last but not least, talk about Catoctin Furnace. Of course, there were enslaved persons there as the principal laborers from 1776 till uh, the 1840s. Um, some enslaved were called out by their jobs. Uh, for instance, Collier Sam, Wagoneer Henry, Farm Sam, Mill Sam, Waiter Bill. Um, and of course, the labor force was gradually replaced by wage uh, laborers. The mule barn at Catoctin Furnace, which unfortunately was torn down in the early 20th century, is now a registered archaeological site. We, we finished that documentation about um, a week ago, and it's now um, site 18 FR, 18 means Maryland, FR means Frederick, and it's 1,154. The site was also used um, as a blacksmith shop in the late 19th and early 20th century, but as you can see, it's a slave quarters. Um, Catoctin Furnace also has the African American Cemetery. Our research project there continues. Um, we have um, sequenced um, the human genome of 20 successfully, uh, or Harvard has, of 27 individuals. We know that we have five families, um, and I'm showing you the relationship of these families through the circles around them. Um, and then we have these morphometric outliers who are mostly older gentlemen who may have been brought for specific iron making skills. They are, however, not related to the families. They are um, uh, they're also outliers, if you can see what I mean, in the cemetery. 
Um, this is one of our forensic facial reconstructions. This is a 35 year old, approximately 35 year old mother. Um, she is buried right here with her uh, infant son. Uh, he lived just a few months after she did, uh, or I should say he died just a few months after she died. She probably died in childbirth. And then she has a brother who is also buried um, in the cemetery. So you can see that familial relationship in the cemetery. Catoctin Furnace also has the Iron Master's Mansion in Auburn. Enslaved workers were in those structures, um, both living in the house, in the basement. Um, and then Moravian Diaries talk about um, a servant living at Auburn who was so, um, his back was so, uh, his backbone was, was, was uh, so compressed that he was bent double. And we actually have a gentleman in the cemetery who fits that, um, physically fits, an older gentleman who physically fits that description. So I wanna talk about Thermont. Um, Thermont has, we have found a colored school. Um, it, un unfortunately, it's no longer extant, but at the corner of East Main and Carroll Streets, um, the Catoctin Clarion in 1882 talks about Mr. Leonard Pick Picking, who has opened a school for colored persons on the property um, uh, in a building attached to the property of Mr. William J. Black of East Main Street. Um, and they have, it says, further that they have on their opening day, they have quite a few colored men, women, and children um, who are coming uh, to the school. Um, unfortunately, we have almost no information about that school other than the fact that it did open and it did exist. In Thurmont as well, we have Amos Tup Lucas. He was a barber. His barber shop, unfortunately, the building no longer stands, um, but it was at the corner of Church Street and Main Street in, uh, in Thurmont. He was born in Virginia, but came with the Henshaws, who were at Catoctin Furnace, um, and then he died in 1917. Um, and as I said, he was a barber. So we don't have a structure associated with Tup, but we do have his presence um, in the landscape. Miss Hannah Hammond, I remember her. She went to the Episcopal Church at Catoctin Furnace. Um, and I love this story. She, when the Secret Service men came with one of the presidents, and I don't remember which one, Hannah had a place. She always sat next to the organ um, and the, the uh, Secret Service agent was in her chair, in her seat, and Miss Hannah um, said, young man, that's my seat, and he moved. Um, she lived on Summit Avenue. Um, she worked at Camp Louise and Camp Airy, and she gave my mother her doll because she knew my mother would see that it never went back to the family that um, had um, given it to her and that had been the family that had enslaved her parents. And so um, it's now in the Thermont Historical Society where it belongs. Um, so Miss Hannah um, was born about 1879. So just after the revolution, uh, just after the Civil War in Virginia. So we have a lot more research and survey to do. We're just, as I said, seven months into a two year project. Uh, Kriggerstown had a large number of African Americans um, uh, before the big fire in the early 19th century. Um, uh, I mean, early 20th century. So we have to uh, work on uh, Kriggerstown, Mount St. Mary's University, again, many enslaved there, St. Joseph's Academy, and then workspaces on farms and within towns throughout the northern part of the county. So this project is going beyond recordation of architectural resources because the, it really is a recovering, it's a recovery of a memory landscape. Um, and while the standing structures, while they're modified, they still retain, in my opinion, significant information. While they may not rise to the level of integrity that we would generally um, uh, present um, for a standing structure, my point, and the you'll hear me saying this a lot, is that these, these structures 
their integrity and their significance remains in their relationship to the African-American population. So obviously this is a group effort to put it mildly, a huge team. Um, I'm just, as I said, the mouthpiece for these amazing researchers. Um, I've told you where the money's coming from and that's all going to the consultants. Um, John Murphy, the architectural historian, Edie Wallace, the historian, uh, Alexandra McDougall, the uh, critical content reader, um, they are uh, the one, and then Edward Quinter, um, uh, uh, who's been the researcher translating the Moravian archives. The Catoctin Furnace Historical Society um, is merely the pass-through for this grant. We don't, um, we will not be receiving um, any of this, uh, I mean, we're, we will be receiving the money, but we will not be keeping any of the money. Um, it will all go to the consultants that are actually um, we're working with. Um, obviously, the residents past and present of the African-American structures, landscapes, and memory are part of our team. Um, Richard Smith, amazing research. Maryland has done so many title searches. I think she's going to stop answering my emails. I hope not, because she is just amazing. Edie Wallace and Alexandra McDougall and Michelle Wright uh, working together on the context. Amanda Whitmore at Frederick County. Um, John Murphy, the architectural historian. Edward uh, Quinter at the Moravian Archives. Rob and I volunteer our time, obviously. Michael Brandon, another volunteer, has been amazing with uh, title search, uh, land records, and mapping. And then, of course, our team uh, funders, if you will, from the Maryland Historical Trust, Heather Barrett, Allison Lutheran, and now Zeal. So that is it for recovering identity, or as I like to call it now, recovering memory. Um, if you have questions, I have not been watching the chat because I've been focused on the slides, but I'm happy if someone actually wants to maybe read the questions or I can scroll back. I hope I haven't gone. No, it looks like I actually didn't go over. I have three minutes, but I'm sure we can take a little longer. So no, thank you. you. You are very good, Elizabeth. Yeah, if you, we already have one question so far. I'm sure they're gonna come running in. Um, if you probably shut down your screen, you might be able to see the um, chat, but also I'm happy to read it to you. Okay. We'll also I have our scroll. people come forward. Okay, I can scroll back. Um, all right, so let me just go. Um, Renee is your first question. Okay, I see Liz. Let me go back to Renee then, pardon me. Um, now I see Liz, can you speak a little about the documents in the Moravian archives? Yes, um, we um, have been translating from Old German um, the diaries and letters sent uh, from Graceham um, and recorded at Graceham by Moravian uh, ministers from the 18, uh, from the 17, um, approximately 1770s uh, 1768, I think is the earliest one, right up through about 1850. Um, they contain um, more information than we had ever gotten from any place else about the African-Americans, not just though at Catoctin Furnace, which was our principal um, area of interest when we began this think because we knew the Moravian ministers were coming to Catoctin, but for instance, we've captured every mention of African Americans in these diaries, as well as um, things like disease or um, epidemic or weather, uh, severe weather, uh, anything that will tell us about, you know, in sort of broad brush, more general uh, information about the northern part of the county. And interestingly enough, for instance, we're getting, we've got a information about the Key family, the Bruce family, you know, Fran that's as in Francis Scott Key and they're enslaved and the Bruce family and they're enslaved. And while they're in Carroll County now, of course, or they are in Carroll County, they were very much part of the Graceham um, 
uh, you know, sort of circuit, if you will. Um, so the Moravian uh, documents, we um, are incorporating that information into this research um, and ultimately will be, um, uh, will be, you know, using them for additional research. Um, they didn't go much into Emmitsburg, interestingly enough, um, because the Catholics were already there. Um, and every once in a while, they have something choice to say. Um, however, the place that was the den of iniquity was Kriggerstown. And since I'm from Kriggerstown, I can say that. It was apparently a wild place. Lots of bars, lots of prostitutes. Um, there was a lot going on in Kriggerstown. So um, uh, if you have any specific questions about the Moravians, I mean, they... Um, you know, I'll try to answer them, but there's just an enormous amount of data um, that we're getting from them. Um, I'm going to scroll down. Um, give me a second, because I know you said there was more questions. Um, oh, there's a question about the Lincoln. Well, the link, yeah, this is such a mystery. This question is, do you think what do you think may have happened to the Lincoln Cemetery graves? I'm sure they were moved, or at least they tried to move them all. As an archaeologist, we often find that the best laid plans of moving a cemetery, because they're, you know, it's often, it's quite often that they're unmarked graves, and graves are missed when there's an attempt to move a cemetery. Basically, just don't do it. Okay, that's my advice. Just do not do it. But they, we can't, we, we don't know. We, we need, um, and, and even our informants who live on Lincoln Avenue um, don't know what happened. They want to know too. Um, it's, there's got to be data somewhere about what happened to those graves, where they were moved, um, but we don't know. So stay tuned on that. But again, that's what I mean about crowdsourcing. If anybody can help us with these um, questions, we would love to, um, to hear from you. Um, so the Black community you mentioned in the Catoctin Mountains in the indication, yes, I wrote a paper on the school. There's absolutely a school. Um, I just didn't include that. There's so much data. I couldn't include everything. There's a mulatto school on Catoctin Hollow Road, and I have extensive research about that. Um, so um, it was started by the Pattersons, not surprisingly. Um, and when the Frederick County um, school system was giving them a hard time because they were using the most wood and, you know, it's like, really, they're the highest elevation in the whole county. Of course, they're going to be using more wood than other people. But they were, you know, bitching and moaning about the cost of the school. And finally, the Pattersons left and they went to Pennsylvania. Um, and you know, I mean, I, I think one of the things we see in this um, in this research is that um, about after 1910, give or take, um, you know, we see just um, around Emmitsburg, we see state families staying, some families staying. But in most of northern Frederick County, people are are leaving. African Americans are leaving. And, you know, we, we, before that, we see these stable, these, these enclaves, churches, cemeteries, schools, and then we see people leaving. Um, and, you know, by about 1910, with few exceptions, the biggest exception being um, in Emmitsburg, um, that people have left. Um, Someone's asking for the address on Crystal Fountain. And I believe, um, I'm not sure which structure. I assume you're asking about the structure that I showed you that is the um, log structure underneath. Um, and um, we have several, we actually have several structures on Crystal Fountain that are African-American, all of which have been modified. But the one I showed you a picture of is 9005 Crystal Fountain Road. Unfortunately, it is not visible from, um, from the roadway at all. It actually sits 
behind Annandale Road. Um, however, the owners are very interested in this research project. So if you want to uh, get in touch with me, and I should have left my, um, can I go back a slide? I should have left my contact information. Uh, there you go. Um, if you would like to contact me, um, we can talk about, but the family there is, is very interested in this project. Are you also looking into Black memories uh, around Camp David? Well, we have not looked at the circle um, and the, um, because I went to Catoctin, so there were African Americans at Camp David um, and they, um, uh, and I assume that's what you're talking about, people who lived at the circle and worked um, at Camp David. Um, that is going to be covered in our 20th century um, chapter, which Edie is working on right now. Um, uh, if you have any other information about um, uh, African Americans at Camp David, other than people who were working at the circle, um, if there's something about um, that we've missed or haven't heard about, we would love to know about that. Um, is there, was there a black newspaper up county? No, not that we're aware of. Uh, did blacks own any property in Berlin? Oh, I think that's an older, I, I, sorry, I must've gone back. My apologies. Um, uh, Camp David, black newspaper. Did you check with Emmitsburg planners for info on the pool? Yes, I did. And we have that. And what I've been told is that before about 2000, they weren't really very uh, judicious about keeping records, although there might be records. Um, I don't know, Mary, you might have something that we haven't seen yet, but Emmitsburg just really wasn't keeping a lot of records uh, in their town office. Um, uh, let's see if there are any other questions. Elizabeth, did you did you say, and forgive me if you did, what year the pool went in, and do we know what company? 1973. 1973. And why are you so sure they moved the graves? Well, God, I hope they did. Yeah, I hope so too. <laughs> hey, you know what? Have you reached out to John Kennard in Thermont? He's mm -hmm. kept, he's been here since 63. His dad took photographs of all kinds of stuff going on in the county. Yeah, maybe, maybe they, maybe they moved them because yeah. somebody, well, no, somebody would have, who was the cemetery? Who was the undertaker in, in that's our next. And, you know, I'm telling you, this is just, this project is so huge. Who was the undertaker in Emmitsburg? That's really who I have to talk to. I got to find the undertaker because that's probably, um, you know, who, who would know. Elizabeth, I, know? Have a, I have a list of undertakers that, um, Keith put together for, uh, from Keeney and Basker that I'll forward to you in case it picks up. It may not go that recent, but also I was wondering, do you know at least what company it was that like had the bulldozer? <laughs> no, we don't know anything. No. Yeah, I'm and, gonna put and, and, this, and Mayor Briggs, Mayor Briggs, um, you know, suggested, which was a great suggestion that I get a hold of the mayor that was uh, mayor then, but that was Mr. Robert Seidel. He did. I got his widow on the phone, but he died. Um, so he's no longer um, here. Um, but I, I just, and you know, and, and again, Mrs. Smith and Mrs. Williams are like, we don't know what happened. The pool just appeared. Um, so I'd really find the guy with the bulldozer because he may have some stories to tell, unfortunately. Elizabeth, the, the key I think is if you look at that deed uh, to Hoke, uh, his, his pledge was uh, to, to reinter any bodies that they found based on where the trustees of the church, which were white trustees. So I think what we need to do is go back to any records that might exist relative to that church, which now exists up up on Main Street. Yeah, and I've called the church, but I haven't gotten I haven't gotten a reply. Yeah, uh, but but it it was to fall to them mm -hmm. to decide uh, uh, where uh, where those those burials, which presumably <clears throat> were not just black, 
No, no, they weren't. No, no, they, it was a mixed. It's definitely a correct, mixed. Sentence. Correct. And, um, and, and my guess is directly south of where the church was or, or to the east of the church, which is still fairly far from, uh, from the pool. But mm -hmm. I think we need to go back to, to your friend who, or, or maybe it was a relative, but in any case, who remembers that cemetery and tried to get her to recall where exactly was that cemetery? Because she remembers a cemetery there. Right. She played in it. Yes. It's Debbie yeah, Smith and yeah. Marie Williams. They both played in it. They yeah, played that, around. That's how, that's how we found the one in Lewistown, because mm -hmm. somebody remembered wandering mm -hmm. through the cemetery. Right. Uh, so I, uh, I think those are two, two avenues to find it, as well as looking at LIDAR. Right. Uh, because well, no, lidar is not going to help us. I don't think, but that. Well, well, we'll look at it anyway. We the yeah. National Archives has been closed again, but we they oh, just geez. reopened, and so Pat is going to um, pull um, historic archived aerial photography. That's uh, that's key rather than lidar because the yeah. historic well, archived I've... aerial photography will tell us uh, will show us. Uh, a 1930s, um, 1940s, 1950s, yeah. um, you know, landscape. Someone's asking um, uh, about the um, permitting um, to move the graves, not in the 70s. No, no. No, no, they, they just get moved. Uh, but it, it's got to be south of the location of the church or east and not that far because it'd be at the extremes of the white graves. Right. Well, at the corner, there was the Kai Holtz barn, and then there was- um, uh, I don't think know, it's that far. Yeah. Well, this is, we're gonna be walking Powell Road, or um, pardon me, Lincoln Avenue tomorrow. So this is one of the things we'll- Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> Let me know when you're going. I'll and be yeah. there. 10 a.m. Lincoln Avenue, 10 a.m. We're, we're oh, oh, okay. Yeah, we're on a we're on a mission here. Um, so um, that's tomorrow. Powell Road is Tuesday. I don't know what Monday is, but you know we're we're surveying. Um, okay. So so anybody, you know, this is th this is the kind of thing, the kind of project that just gets stronger by the information that people like our wonderful audience, thank you, um, asks, you know, somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who says, you know, hey, you know, what do you know about this or that? And thank you to anyone who helps us by asking those questions. And I see that Mary has sent, um, you know, uh, a, a question, do you have any information on the Methodist Episcopal Church in Emmitsburg on Lincoln? Um, so not really. And again, we've called the, um, church that is the sort of, um, yeah, uh, that, that, that's the, that's the church that never got transferred to whites, uh, to blacks. Uh, but apparently there were, well, clearly, uh, there was at least one black woman. Uh, mm -hmm. who, uh, you know, the... Uh, yeah, Constance. The yeah, last the Constance time. mother mm -hmm. of, of John T. Right. Uh, and I've talked... He was buried there, and they were going to bury him, and they discovered, whoa, uh, we're going to be digging up a grave where, where his mother is already buried. So right. he winds up uh, uh, in... Uh, At the grotto. Uh, in the St. Anthony's. Right. right. And um, the person I've been trying to get a hold of is Reverend Richard Baker. He's the pastor of the United Methodist Church. But I figure I'll just go there tomorrow, not to church, but I'll, you know, try to buttonhole yeah. somebody as they walk out the door. And so I asked we'll that question. I asked the question, Elizabeth, because we have a group called the, it's the um, 
Emmitsburg Council of Churches. And mm -hmm. Pastor John from the Lutheran Church said, I thought there was a black, you know, church on Lincoln. Um, mm -hmm. We couldn't find out, you know, the placement or I couldn't find any history about it. So well, we have, have we actually have it, you know, um, have it on the, um, I sh there should be an easier way to do this. I'm not very good at this kind of thing. Um, we actually have it on the side. <laughs> um, uh, hold on a second. Give me a second to just come back here. I started with Emmitsburg, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, so here's here we are. That you know, I love that barn where James Augustine Briscoe worked. I just think that's the coolest thing. Um, okay, so there's the pool. There's John Constance get it being buried, but not there. Here's the color. See, this is the only place though on the Sanborn that we have it being colored yeah. and this is a mystery um but anything that you know anybody that's i mean i'm not from emmitsburg i'm just trying to come up to speed on emmitsburg obviously um to, uh, but anybody that knows more about emmitsburg than i do or knows who to ask we would really appreciate your help with this because this is important um you know we've yeah. all seen so many cemeteries african-american cemeteries um, you know, that have been, um, you know, lost. And this one is, is, is critical, really. Yeah, it, it's interesting that the, the Constance, uh, Constant, Constance, uh, seem to be Catholic, uh, because they're buried in uh, the, the descendants one generation are are buried in Saint Anthony's, mm -hmm. and yet the mother was buried in a Methodist cemetery. Mm -hmm. So I mean, what's going on there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. Uh, it it was his, it was John T's wife who finally made the decision to have him buried, uh, not in the Methodist cemetery but mm -hmm. in the Catholic cemetery. And then his children mm -hmm. uh, and his wife uh, are, are buried there uh, along the road up, up to the shrine. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so it, it, it's, it's, it's really interesting. Um, well, anyway. It is, it is. But anybody, I mean, I so appreciate, you know, any help that, that, um, any leads, you know, you know where to find us. Um, it's ecomer at catoctonfurnace.org um, uh, or info at catoctonfurnace.org. And we would just love, um, you know, and, and it's the Camp David. If there's any information from the gentleman, let me scroll back up, who asked about Camp David. Um, if you have any information about um, or Wendy, okay, sorry, Wendy, um, about, uh, you know, people that lived or worked um, at Camp David, um, that would be really, that would be really helpful. Yeah. Um, obviously, it's 20th century, but we're looking, you know, obviously, our, our research is going right up through the present, um, the present day. Um, yeah. And I'll try to find out who built that pool or who the contractor was. I need the, I, if, if they moved the grading that, that both the Lee family, which was very extensive along Annandale mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and Constance, for example, but there were Browns and, and whatever uh, up, up in Emmitsburg that we have not yet found anyone either in in uh, adjacent southern Pennsylvania or the, the southern part of the county who have any recollection. So, uh, the, you know, again, we, we need to ask out, and I've spent years doing it, uh, mm -hmm. to the black community, 
do you have any recollection uh, of ancestors uh, that that hail from uh, from the northwestern uh, a portion of the county? Mm -hmm. There have got to be there. I mean, we know the Pattersons, the Pattersons and the Calamers, Calamans. Uh, they're they're in in uh, southern Pennsylvania, right across the border. We 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 know that, uh, but we can't find uh, uh, descendants uh, of of these fairly extensive because it, if you go to Charles Lee, grew a community up up north up Annadale Road, and and uh, there were folks in Emmitsburg who are connected back down south. So mm -hmm. there's got to be someone out there uh, who, who's got some uh, family record, some uh, family remembrance, mostly, uh, mm -hmm. of connection to that. And we just need to continue to reach out to, to the, the current community. Uh, think back, think back. What did grandma say? <laughs> this is right. sort of stuff. Well, the, the the family names, of course. I mean, there are many, but Coates, Butler, Williams, Richardson, uh, Lee, um, um, uh, um, Wolf. Um, you know, there there are so many. But I think this is the beauty of Arch, the Arch Center, the Arch Heritage Center in Frederick, because yeah. they that will be. Um, the place where you know these families um that are coming to the county and and when the the county does the other areas of the county not just north county but south east south and southwest um you know when when they you know have these names and people are doing their genealogical um you know connection back to frederick county um they'll be able to go to arch as their, you know, as their sort of point of contact. Um, so that's really, um, that's really exciting. One question that we have, if someone knows an answer to this, we're trying to figure out as we look at the church, the Catholic churches in Emmitsburg, whether they were segregated in the, in the way and where people, the Moravians, you know, one of the things that they say in the diaries is they quote this, uh, an African-American woman, um, this is about 1790, um, maybe about 1795. And she's upset naturally because when she goes to church, no one wants to sit next to her. Um, and that indicates to us that without a doubt, frankly, there was segregation, you know, people were <clears throat> segregating themselves in the Moravian, you know, in at Gray Sam in the Moravian church. Maybe it wasn't intended by the ministers, but it was the reality in the pews. So we're trying to figure out whether there was, we know St. Euphemia's was segregated. There's no question. The children could not walk in the front door, the African-American children. They had their separate room where they were taught Absolutely. But were the church, you know, sanctuaries, right? Were they segregated in the seating within the churches? So if anybody knows, I've emailed Sister Betty Ann and um, she's out in Chicago now. Um, but if anybody knows the answer to that or has a source for that, um, we would very much like to know. And then if we have missed anything, which I'm sure we have, but if you know of a place in the northern part of the county where there was African American presence, um, you know, uh, either that they owned or they worked or they, um, you know, there was an African American uh, renting. Uh, for instance, down on Wilhite Road, we have a Mr. Butler. Um, unfortunately, his house is gone, but we know he was down there. Um, near Stevens Road on Wilhide Road, probably working in the mill. So that's a memory that we want to capture. 
we, it isn't a standing structure that can have an MIHP form, but it's a memory within the landscape that we want to, um, to, to make, we want that information, um, you know, captured, if you will. Um, oh, I'm getting an answer. Thank you from Rose. Oh, and Scott. Okay, so Scott is saying, I'm almost certain that the Catholic churches would have been segregated, but you might be best to contact the Archdiocese of Baltimore Archives at St. Mary's University to confirm, find out exactly when that ended. And Rose is saying, yes, they were segregated inside the sanctuaries of other Catholic churches in the county. So thank you to both of you. And I will follow up with that. Rose, thank you for that oral history. That's really helpful. And Scott, I will follow up with that as uh, with that research as well. Okay. Any, any other? I'm sorry. Any other questions for Elizabeth? Thank you, Elizabeth, ever so much. Rick, also thank you for adding some other information into that and us watching kind of the research process happening online. Um, Carrie or Scott has a slide to share before we send everybody on our way. And again, thank you ever so much for that. That was absolutely